Hello everyone, how's everyone doing today? Once again, this is Ewan Henry with Tech In My Life. So today I wanna to talk about a couple items that I use when I'm outside. And I wanna talk a little bit about grilling and technology and how I use those two things to just add a little bit more flavor to my life, if you will. Now, I know, again, like some of my other videos, what does grilling have to do with technology? Uh, first and foremost, the grill that I uh, prefer to use is a Kamado style grill, specifically the model that I have is a Kamado Joe. Um, there's a few others on the market um, similar to this grill in price range, such as the Big Green Egg or um, the Primo, but I decided to go with the Kamado grill. Today, I'm not going to only focus on the grill and the technology that's in the grill, but I want to focus on um, just the all around cooking experience using a grill and um, technology to get really good, consistent, almost predictable results. Um, like I said, using a grill and using technology. Now for me, it's, a, it's kind of a threefer because there's three things that I get into a lot. I like technology, I'm a tech, um, technology enthusiast, I'm a cycling enthusiast, and I'm a grilling enthusiast. Now, with those three things, one, uh, pardon the pun, tend to feed the other. Now, I say one feed the other because I love eating. As a cyclist, I tend to burn a lot of um, carbs. I tend to just burn a lot of energy going out three, four hour rides sometimes. Um, and you know, you're gonna go through a lot of uh, fuel food wise. And one of my indulgence is taking some time. You know, if I'm not uh, cycling for three or four hours, I can easily take three or four hours and spend that on the grill. Um, now, where there's this culmination of technology for grilling, it's the grill itself, right? And then there's the part where you have to monitor your cook. And part of monitoring your cook, you need a great thermometer. And the thermometer that I choose is um, the Fireboard. And Fireboard is one of these things where it makes life so much easier, especially for me grilling and I'm grilling using charcoal. I, I don't mind, I have nothing against a gas grill. There's um, just certain convenience to just being able to go push the ignite button and the gas comes on and you can cook immediately. So that's great. But I like the process of getting charcoal, putting the charcoal in. Um, when I buy a big bag of charcoal, I, I, I use like three separate brands, um, but not all of the charcoal to me comes um, equal. Some, I prefer the Kamado Big Block and it's like the name implies, they're bigger chunks. There's the process of the charcoal. I pick out each, not, not each, but I pick out a lot of the bigger block, the bigger the chunk, the bigger chunks, and I fill my um, charcoal basket up. I light my charcoal, and I have a, a little process for um, igniting my, um, my fuel. Now, once the fuel gets going and the fire gets going, the, the, one of the things with a Kamado style grill because the grill it's oval shape and in many ways it's similar to like a Weber kettle style grill but because it's um, ceramic you have some pluses to the ceramic that you don't get with a steel grill first and foremost you get ridiculous insulation um, my grill is maybe an inch thick I'd have to double check. It's a prox it's over 100 pounds, um, maybe 150, I think. And it's really cool the way they ship it to you. They ship it to you on a pot on a pallet. When I got mine, um, the guy used a lift to get it off the truck and a forklift to get it um, into my driveway and into my garage. And I built this contraption. Um, there is all type of videos on how to transport it. And I built a contraption to transport it to the back of my house. Me and my wife lifted it, were, were able to um, lift it up and carry it to the back of the house. Now, because it's ceramic, you don't want 
this thing to drop. So there's a lot of instructions on how you hold it when you uh, transport it. Because it's ceramic, um, there's a great side to that. It'll never corrode like a metal grill will. Um, you know, it'll never rust out, right? But the drawback is if you ever drop it and crack it, that's pretty much it. It's over. But it being so heavy, it's very... Once you transport it and get it to a particular location and you get it onto the, um, the grill rack, the chances of it falling, it, it's really slim. It, it's slim to none unless you have to move it. Um, if you're moving or you hire a moving company and you're moving from one location to the other, that's probably where you have to exercise the most caution because they pack it really well when they're bringing it to you and then now taking it from you know, your point A to your point B, that can be problematic. So that's where you gotta be really careful. But outside of that, um, the grill itself is, is um, not really the only part to this conversation, um, grilling with technology. Grilling with technology, the grill has its technology in heat retention and the, the way the heat um, radiates from the, the walls of the grill. The, the, the wall of the grill, the side walls are, are about maybe an inch thick. I could be off on that. Um, and it's an oval shaped grill, similar in many ways to a kettle style grill. Um, you have air coming in through the bottom and the air flows up and it's this like cyclone that causes this uh, convection where you get food cooking really evenly all around um, the grill. So there's really no hot spots. So your food cooks evenly throughout. So one of the, the, the technologies there not even so much technology, but you know, there's like three different types of heating. You have your convection heating, which is the airflow, the air coming in through the bottom of the grill, um, through the bottom vent, flowing up through the top and, and cooking the meat all around. There's your convection heat, there's your radiate, radiant heat, which is heat um, that's radiated from the sides, side walls of the grill. And, and being that the grill is ceramic, you know, it'll take a little bit longer to heat up the entire um, ceramic surface. But once it gets to your desired temp, it'll retain that heat quite efficiently. You know, like I said before, there's your convection heat, your radiant heat. And now if you're going to sear food, right, you have a nice juicy steak and you want those nice sear marks on your uh, steak. Now you're dealing with induction heating where you have heat transferring um, from a hot surface to another um, item. In this case, you know, if you put a nice steak on it, the, the, the transfer of the heat from the grate to the steak, that, that would be your induction heating. And what the grill does is because it can get so hot, you can really get some nice searing done when it comes to like searing steaks or, and, and different meats. Now, I just mentioned the grill can get hot. This grill can top out probably at 900 degrees, right? I've gotten it up to 850. I was doing a cleaning. There's a whole process to cleaning the grill. Um, and, and that part of that process is getting it up to a really high temp, sort of like a self-cleaning um, uh, oven in your house. And you get it up 700 degrees, you leave it there for an hour or so. When you open it up, anything that's in there has pretty much been um, just burnt away. So uh, it can get to those high temperatures. And with getting to those high temperatures, one of the things you can make, of course, is pizza. So there's the diversity that comes with um, having this type of grill, you can do low and slow where I've done eight hour grills at, you know, that 245 to, to 265 range and eight hours, it just kind of goes. I, I fill the basket up with maybe three quarter of a big block coal and um, charcoal and it'll go nine times out of 10. I'll actually have charcoal left over after a low and slow eight hour um, grill. So 
it can go low, it can go high. You know, it retains its heat. It, it's very stable. It's very consistent. So those are just the points of the grill. Now, that's just one part of this whole conversation. The other part of the conversation is the technology that I use to, to sort of meld the grilling and the technology together. And that's by using a, a thermometer called a fireboard. Now it's not only the grill that's awesome and makes this experience um, something really, really fantastic. What it is, it's a, an app based driven device that it has three probes. And what the probe does, you have an ambient temperature probe. You'll put that on the grate of your grill. That's going to measure your all around temperature of the grill. You have two more probes that you're going to, you can insert into different pieces of meat, but the device can take up to six different probes. So what you're going to find in the box is the device. And I opted for um, a blower unit. And we're going to talk about the blower unit a little bit more in a, uh, a few more minutes. And um, the three probes. Mine came with three probes. You can get more probes if you need them. Now, my routine is I'll start my grill. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll put my charcoal in. I'll light my fuel. I'll get the grill to uh, round about my desired temperature. And then what I'll do is I'll attach the blower unit. Once the grill is at my desired temperature, when I attach the blower unit, I, oh, well, let's describe what the blower unit. The blower unit is basically a fan. It's a fan that you attach to the lower vent and that forces air into the grill. So if your temperature is starting to go down, the ambient temperature heat probe, that's going to say, oh, the temperature is below the point where you set, which brings me to another part. You, you set your temperature on the device itself. Once you set that desired temperature, if that desired temperature is too high, the fan won't be on. If the temperature is too low now, the fan will kick on and it'll force air into the lower chamber of the grill, thus causing the uh, flame to get more oxygen. And of course, that's going to make the fire um, burn more. So, you know, the concept is, is relatively simple, but of course the algorithm and the software that's driving it, I'm sure it's pretty sophisticated stuff. And one of the best uh, examples is when I open the grill to check on something and then I close it back, of course, if it's done relatively quickly, you open it up, you let out a lot of heat. So the temperature goes down. Um, it also senses, those openings. So if it's like a rapid decline, the fan won't come on. Now you close the lid and the temperature slowly starts going back up. And I guess what it'll do, it, it, it's again, it's, it's, it's some type of algorithm saying, well, the temperature is rising X, you know, at, at this particular rate. So let's kick the fan on and, and feed it a little bit more air so we can get it back up to that set point temperature. Um, at a more quicker rate. And that's exactly what happens. I open the grill sometimes, the heat, the heat escapes, I check on my food, I close the grill, and a few moments later, I'll hear the fan spin up, force that air in, and then it tapers right back off. Now, looking at the app, what you can see is, you'll see, in my case, um, there's a graph and on the graph, you'll see three separate lines. They're all color coded. Um, one line represents the ambient temperature. Another line will represent um, meat probe one or meat probe two, whatever you're cooking, probe one or probe two. And if you select uh, the drive option, you touch on the drive option, it'll toggle through and it'll show you when the fan was on and what percent uh, the fan kicked into, whether it was just one, two, three, all the way up to 100%. So what this basically does is having a graph that shows you your entire cook, you know, if you do, um, 
a six hour cook and I'll get into a, a six hour cook that I just did and, and how I did the cook. But if you did a six hour cook and your, your, whatever you're cooking came out really great. Now you have a reference. Now you have all this information because it's all stored from the time you start to the time you turn it off. That whole session is stored and you can go back into each session and look and see what you did that did work or what you did that didn't work. Or if you had some type of problem, you can sort of examine and say, oh, and figure out your problems. Now I'm going to speak about this last grill that I just did, which was some ribs. Okay. Hey guys, I'm just curious. Um, I'm trying a new audio setup. So, you know, please, if you got a second, leave a comment, letting me know how the audio sound. Um, I'm just recently trying this uh, wireless go. You can probably barely see the laugh mic right there. I'm trying this wireless go system. Um, and if the audio sounds a little better, uh, it's something I want to switch to. I was using a lav mic that's wired and I, it just became too cumbersome. And I, I wasn't too sure of the audio quality, but like I said, I'm trying this wireless go. Let me know how it sounds in the comment section. And if you guys want to see a video on the setup that I'm using with the wireless go, let me know. And I'll just, um, I'll put something together to uh, get out to you guys. All right. Thanks. Now I have my process for this whole thing. You know, I, I have a routine that I go through, which is I typically, I, I like to, um, season, marinate my meat the night before, let it sit, take it out, um, give it a time to kind of get some of the chill off of the meat before I put it onto the grill. And my, seasoning method, method, my marinating method, it, it's really simple, right? Now, if, if you're going to try to just repeat this type of grilling, what I did here is just something really easy. And I think anyone can do, and anyone should have access to this, um, stuff here. First, I'll just use olive oil as my binding agent. Now that's just something that I'll put on to the meat to have my rub just kind of stick to the meat. And then I use McCormick's for this grill. I just use McCormick's. When I say grill, by the way, I'm talking about a cooking session, but not specifically the grill itself. For this um, session of cooking, uh, grilling, I used McCormick's. Now you should probably get, be able to get McCormick's um, rub at just about any grocery store. There's definitely other rubs you can get that are a little bit more this and more that, depending on your flavor, or your taste, whatever you're going for. Lots of different rubs you can get online. But like I said, McCormick's readily available just about any grocery store and their rub is decent enough. So I'll start off, like I said, with my olive oil. I'll rub the olive oil onto uh, my meat, in this case, ribs. Then I like to start with the show side up and I'll explain why I'll marinate the show side. Then I'll turn it over to the bottom. I'll marinate the bottom and then I'll turn the show side back over. I like turning it down for a little while so that there's a little bit of pressure on the, uh, on the marinade, just kind of pressing it into the meat evenly. And then I'll turn it back over and then I'll slightly put a little more marinade on top of um, the meat, let it sit for a while. Like I said, I let it sit. It, best case scenario is overnight or um, at least until the chill is off of the meat. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a bind, you can definitely, you don't have to have it sit overnight. You know, it's not a must, but that's just something I like to do. So now here's where I ran into a problem on my last grill. Um, what I did was I typically grill baby back ribs and baby back ribs can fit onto, um, my grill, three racks of baby back rib. I don't have to cut them maybe just a little bit off the ends, but typically I don't have to cut them in half or anything like that. They can usually fit right onto my grill. My grill is 18 inches and it has a, I have a, uh, an attachment that's like a second rack. Um, that I put on top of a uh, second grade that I put on top of the first grade. So I have like two shelves and typically two rack of ribs on the first shelf, one rack of rib on the second shelf. I'll insert a probe into one 
at the bottom and one at the top because it's in two separate um, heating zones. So I kind of want to know if this is the, the ribs at the top is cooking um, slower than the, the ribs at the bottom. And of course, when I say cooking, we're talking about the internal temperature. Um, that's why we're inserting the probe in, in, in for the that's why we're inserting the probes into the meat in the first place is because of the internal temperature. Now, all of that's important because you don't want your ambient temperature to be so high. It'll just kind of burn the outside if the inside is not heating up well. So there's there, that's a whole nother um, ball of wax. We're not going to get into all of that. But basically, um, if you're low and slow, you, you really don't have to worry about you know, external temperature being super high. And by low and slow, I'm talking anything from, let's say, 225 to around maybe 275, 300 at the most for low and slow. Um, and low and slow, I'm usually referring to stuff that's being smoked. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Like I said, I typically do baby back rib. This time, I did the St. Louis style ribs. And those are wider they're a little flatter, but they're wider. And I could not fit two at the bottom, one at the top like I planned. I typically get my ribs from Costco's and they come three in, in a container. And with that three, I usually do one at the top, two at the bottom. But like I said, because these are so wide, I could not fit two at the bottom. So I got everything seasoned up. And I go out to the grill and I open the grill and I try to fit them onto the, the, the bottom grate. Couldn't fit it successfully. And the grill is open. I'm horsing around with this, trying to get it all to fit before I finally give up. And at that point, because the grill is opened up, now it's being fed a lot of air. And what happened is the fire becomes bigger and it heats up more coal, right? And because the heat is starting from a small spot and it's just going to emanate out to more coal, more coal gets heated. It heats up the ceramic, which is like, you know, one of the big drawbacks, which is it's great that it's um, so well insulated, right? But then once it heats up, it retains that heat for quite some time. Now, if I want to be around 250 and I'm, you know, I, I let it get too much oxygen and heat up more coal and the fire is hotter and now my temperature spikes all the way up to almost 400 degrees, right? So my temperature shoots up and what happens? Now I'm dealing with 100 plus pounds of heated up ceramic that's not going to lose that 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 temperature very slowly at all it's going to take quite some time so you know you don't want with, with low and so low and slow smoking ribs you don't want to grill the ribs you don't want to cook the ribs you want it to kind of smoke the ribs right and, and it's a subtle distinction there maybe a distinction without a difference is you know smoking and cooking because you're technically cooking whatever but you don't want those temperatures to go higher than like, for oh, I'll say me, I don't want that temperature higher than 275. I want it 265, 250 perfect for me. Some people go a little lower and, and it, you know, it's all what you can do and you get comfortable with to get you the results that you like. But in this case, like I said, my temperature went all the way up to almost 400 degrees. I, Cut, I got the ribs cut um, down in size to fit onto the grill finally. And I'm out there, I, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, now I'm down to like 350, still higher than I want. But now I'm also working against the clock because I also had some other things to do. So it's like, put the ribs on. And I can tell from the moment, as soon as I put the ribs on, that my temperature was higher than I wanted because I, you know, I, I looked at a part of the bottom and it was seared and I, you, 
when I put my ribs on, I don't want sears. I don't want sear marks on my ribs. So I was pretty annoyed and I walked into my wife. I walked inside and said, babe, this is a disaster. She's like, oh yeah, you're just being overdramatic. And I was because I know the temperature was gonna go down and everything would be fine because the vast majority of the, the grill, you know, the vast majority of me grilling, the temperature was gonna be where I wanted it, but I did not wanna start off at at 350 degrees and work down slowly to um, 100, I'm sorry, to, to 250, but you know what? That's exactly what I did. I put it on and I kept it moving because I had other things to do. But looking at the chart, I can see exactly what happened. I mean, I know what happened, I was there, but, but knowing not to make that mistake again, right? Knowing to, hey, check the, the size, make sure it can fit, do all of that beforehand so I, I'm not going to make that mistake again. And while you probably don't need an app to tell you that, what I do like about having the app is it's still there. The information is there. And for me, as I'm grilling, another part of the app that I really like is as I'm grilling and I'm, that periodically, um, well, this method I use is, is a three to one method, very popular. Three hours to start off with, two hours wrapped in foil or butcher block paper, last hour taken out of the butcher block paper or the foil and just grill. And at that point you add your, um, your barbecue sauce of your, your choice. Um, so what I did this time, like I said, when I started off, the temperature went up really high and that was my three hours. Started off really high, came down for maybe two and a quarter hours. It was right where I wanted it to be. And then I opened up the grill. Now, what, what I alluded to when I said what I really liked was I can use my phone or a tablet or whatever I'm using to take a photo of my progress at that time. So after three hours, I opened up the grill before I took the ribs off to wrap them. I took a photo, wrapped them, put them back on. And, and it's, it might not be super critical, but I do think um, it's kind of important once you take them off to put them back on in the same place, in the same placement. So which, whichever two was at the bottom, I put back on the bottom, then the one on the top, and, and I insert the same probes back into each one of the, to the respective um, racks and kept it moving from there. So j just to go back over, there's, I got my routine for starting the grill. And then I got my routine for seasoning. And as I'm going, I'm tracking all of this progress. Once I put the ribs onto the grill, I'm tracking all of this process in the app. I can see how my temperatures either fluctuated or not fluctuated. If my temperature is fluctuated, it could have been a windy day. And then, you know, I've had that experience before. My temperatures were kind of all over the place. And I was like, oh, it was windy. So now I know for a windy day, shut the vents down a little bit more because the wind will force more air into the lower chamber, thus making the fire heat up more. But I, I go back over the cooks. Now what that I go back over my grilling sessions. And what that really does is it, it, it makes you, it gives you the ability to be more consistent and it gives you the ability to be predictable in what you're going to be doing. You know, your results become more predictable. And, and that's, I think that's, that's kind of awesome because now when I cook and I, I'm, and I have my methods down pat and I'm repeatedly doing something similar and I'm getting um, better, good results or better than the last time results is just refining my process. And what shortened that learning curve is having that fireboard to um, thermometer, which tracks my project progress and, and just gives me that ability to, to look back on each one of my grilling sessions and, and refine my process. I'm gonna do my best to leave links in the description for just about everything that I talk about. But if I happen to cover something and I don't leave a link, 
and you guys are looking for more information, please feel free to use the comments section to ask any question and I'll do my best to answer them as soon as possible and in the best way I can. So that's it for now. If you guys found any information here useful, please leave a thumbs up. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments section. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Again, this is you and Henry with Tech In My Life, where we just talk about tech that I use in and around my house on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you guys for tuning in, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye.